I'm Christina Brown, and this is Our Take on Arise TV. And joining me today as guest host is Rupa Michelinini. She is an attorney and a media and celebrity trial commentator and analyst. And Rupa, I am so happy to have you here. You're also no stranger to Arise TV. You've joined Tebby Turner Bell on Arise America a few times as well. That's absolutely right. I'm so pleased to be here. Okay, good. And here's the other thing. I know you're not shy, so don't hold back. All right, we've got a lot to cover today. First off, topping our stories in The Daily Take, our continuing coverage of the killing of Trayvon Martin, the George Zimmerman trial. The first group of potential jurors still stands at 32 who have been asked to return to the court by the judge. Now, once the trial gets underway, it is expected that tens of dozens of witnesses could take the stand. And Rupa, you have covered many, many high profile cases before. What is it about this case that you really think is the central component? What does it hinge on? Right, the crux of this case is really the stand your ground law. It's essentially saying that you are allowed to use violent force in order to protect yourself, and the majority of states in this country allow for that. Uh, however, the most of the states insist that you have to back off first before you use undue force. In Florida, that's not necessary. In this case, this is why those 911 tapes are so essential, trying to figure out who it was that yelled, help, please stop. Was it Zimmerman? Was it Trayvon Martin? And of course, we still don't know whether or not the judge, Deborah Nelson, is actually going to allow for the analysis of the 9-1 tapes to be used in court. Correct. And even if she does, we've got experts on both sides claiming that the voice was Trayvon's or the, vo the voice was Zimmerman's. So. Right. All right. Thanks so much, Rupa. Well, in another very high profile story, this talking about the military and the role of women. Sweeping changes underway in the U.S. military. The Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, and Marine Infantry units, currently all male units, will now have to make room for the ladies, or shall I say the female soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines. Women will now be allowed to serve in the most rigorous, intense combat positions in the military. And full disclosure here, I have to say that I am a proud Air Force veteran. Obviously, I did not serve in any kind of specialized unit because it wasn't allowed. At first glance, I think that this is something that is really good for the armed services and long overdue. But as you might imagine, there's going to be a lot of pushback. No, there absolutely will be a lot of pushback. And I think the key here is the changes that the roles women have always in recent years have been allowed in the military. But have they been in the front lines? Have they been playing the same roles? Have men felt that they, they can rely on these on these women? And, and it's interesting because even uh, Ch Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Dempsey, recently said this past week that given the sexual assault issue, that have been mm -hmm. going on in the military recently. He thinks that this new push towards equality, bringing women into the Navy SEALs, would actually perhaps help in the sexual assault situation as well. Although some might argue that it might put women at greater risk with regards to having them serve alongside uh, male-dominated units and not having enough women in those ranks, perhaps they might need that protection. I think the other question, too, is what are the military standards that are going to be in place? I mean, there are certain physical requirements that are necessary to fulfill these various specialized units and, and, and roles. Are they going to change now that women are going to be allowed to compete for for them? Right. They're saying that they won't change these standards, that every man and woman has to compete equally for that position and they have to pass the test, the, the rigorous uh, physical uh, exams that are involved. So. Yeah. Well, good luck to G.I. Jane. I, I, I say that it's a, it's a good step forward and at least the option is there. It's on the table for women to compete for the positions. Whether or not they get the positions, whether or not they get equality and protection right. while they're in the position, mm -hmm. well, that's another story. But Rupa, staying on this topic of the military, and while the military, and you brought this up, grapples with this growing problem of military sexual trauma, many women are actually thinking twice about joining the armed forces, much less considering these specialized units. Sherry Kurtz, uh, we had a photograph with her with her daughter. She actually told a very uh, painful story when her daughter, Shabron Kurtz, confessed to a dark secret. In fact, Shabron Kurtz went to her mother and said, I want to join the Army. And it was because Sherry was the victim of a gang rape back in 1985 when she was in the Army that she advised her daughter, Shabron, not to choose the military as a path, as a career choice. That, in many ways, I think is very detrimental to women as well. On the one hand, you talk about the military and you can't help but recognize the elephant in the room, which is the military has a, a sexual assault 
problem. On the other hand, it is another career option that we should go for if that's what we want to do. Right, right. Well, what's fascinating about this particular topic is that we've heard psychologists say over many years that rape and sexual assault is not a sex crime as much as it's a crime of domination. It's a crime of anger. And so I think we can go back again to uh, joint, uh, joint chairman, uh, the chief joint. Eh, Dempsey. Yeah, Dempsey. Got it. I know who you're talking about. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. And in his statements, there would be less resentment if men and more women are working side by side, but equally contributing, and there is a team feeling as, you know, where you feel that this woman is watching your back, you need her. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then you're not gonna be resentful and angry, and perhaps this could reduce the sexual assault cases mm -hmm. in the military. It's interesting because so many times when we hear from uh, soldiers from Iraq and Afghanistan, and they talk about what moves them, what motivates them to run toward the line of fire and they talk about they're fighting for their brother beside them, for the soldier next to them. And perhaps using that train of thought that you're, that you're, that you're saying, Rupa, if they believe that they are in the line of fire because they're fighting for that female service member beside them, then they're less apt to see that person as other, as different, as someone who should be an object of their um, infatuation. Precisely, it would be their sisters fighting alongside them. Yeah, I, I think it would be interesting to see how that plays out. I know for myself, when I was in the military, when I was in boot camp, obviously in boot camp, you had all female units training with one another, all male units training with one another, and at certain stages within boot camp, there was integration. There were certain exercises that we did together. That was the Air Force, but the Marine Corps doesn't do it like that. The Marine Corps makes it separate but equal all the way, starting at the boot camp level. And I remember, even at boot camp, there were questions about which was better for the armed services, mm -hmm. that method of training or a method of training that incorporated integration at the early stage of military life. Sure, right. Well, what we have, of course, at the university level is co-ed education. Why sure. shouldn't it be the same in the military? Absolutely. Well, this story, uh, Rupa, is coming to us from England. Celebrity chef Nigella Lawson and her ad executive husband, Charles Satchi, are making headlines, but unfortunately for all the wrong reasons. Snapshots actually captured her husband with his hands around Lawson's neck in an apparent chokehold. Now, what's really fascinating about this is some might call it the spin that Sachi put out later and coming from an ad person, if anyone could do it, it would be him. He says that what these photographs actually captured was a heated argument or debate between he and his wife about the children and he was simply demonstrating uh, what uh, hands around the wrist or hands around the neck might look like, that he wasn't necessarily attacking her, but this was a way to demonstrate, I don't know, some form of corporal punishment. I mean, it, it, it is an un, unexplainable explanation. It's extremely odd, and let's face it, the police have come out with uh, the statement to the media that the individual, the man who they would not name as Charles Saatchi necessarily, mm -hmm. did admit to some form of physical offense against Nigella Lawson, and e essentially he's been given a slap on the wrist or a warning, yeah. but this would be used against him in the future if there were any other violent episodes. What do you make out of the all the photographs that were taken, yet we didn't see anyone attempting to intervene? Uh, what do you make of that? Right. Well, we're talking about a husband and wife at a public restaurant mm -hmm. having an argument, a beautiful sunny afternoon, I believe, in England, and paparazzi nearby, people aware of the celebrity. And it's very possible that I, I sometimes wonder there are pe people do, people are helpful. There are good Samaritans in this world, but they may have looked at the celebrity couple and just wanted to stay away. Mm -hmm. And that celebrity may have, in fact, not, you know, hurt her in some ways because. Luckily, I don't think that she was damaged in her neck and she wasn't no, in pain. No, but she pain, was seen but, crying and visibly right. upset. It certainly exactly. looked like it was more than what they said it was. That's right, and nobody ran to her rescue. Yeah, and that is unfortunate, yeah. and we know that that happens all too often Correct. to victims of domestic abuse. Well, the roots of two very high-profile ladies are being traced to lands far from home. Take a look. Princess Diana seems to have some roots significantly to the east of the British Isles. Genetic testing company Britain's DNA announced a woman from India who immigrated to England named Eliza Kiwark 
may be Diana's direct ancestor some five generations back. She is described as a dark-skinned native of Bombay. And First Lady Michelle Obama, as well as her daughters, Sasha and Malia, spent time in Dublin at Trinity College tracing the Obama's Irish roots. In fact, Sasha and Malia are apparently quoted as saying that they get to prove their Irish uh, ancestry a little better than some of their Irish friends back at home. I think for so many of us, we're not necessarily shocked to know that if you are African American, that somewhere in your lineage there is Caucasian roots, and if you are Caucasian, somewhere in your lineage there are roots of uh, some sort of ethnicity uh, of color. It, it, I don't think it's shocking, yet at the same time, it is fun and interesting to find out. It really is. It's not shocking, and particularly when you look at Diana, Princess Diana, and you look at the British royal family. I mean, England has such a close connection, for example, with India for so many years, the, you know, the Indian Raj, the British Raj, excuse me. Yeah. Um, so it's it's not shocking, and, and frankly, I, I mean, you and I, I'm sh I'm certain are of mixed yeah. heritage as well. We people... might be cousins way back, way back. <laughs> Actually, if we go I'm, far and both back. <laughs> that we are. And people are always shocked when I tell them I'm Finnish, Indian, Persian, right. <laughs> Italian combination. Well, it looks good. <laughs> Whatever you are, it, it all looks good. <laughs> Moving on to one of our final stories for the Daily Take, there is actually a lot of buzz about the new documentary Dark Girls, which looks at the attitudes and bias against dark skin women around the world. It's going to be shown on Oprah's own network this Sunday. And of course, this is an age old conversation that simply will not go away. And in fact, later on in the program, we are going to be talking to a Latina teenager who actually now chooses to acknowledge her dark skin as part of her Dominican heritage. You know, this term, this phrase, this phrase, dark skin in and of itself, the connotations often are so negative when in reality, dark skin is so beautiful but it is kind of painful for some for some people and in, certainly within some segments of even the African American community to have dark skin was you know you were you were a greater license or a greater victim of discrimination sure i would like to just point out that everyone I know is baking themselves in the sun to get a tan. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> so I think That's perhaps so those connotations have been changing over, over years. But it's still very sad when you think about certain countries and cultures. You look at India, you look at Asia, the Asian countries, South America, where one of the primary products, cosmetic products that's sold on the market is skin bleaching products right. in order to lighten their skin. Yeah, terrible, so. terrible. If only we could just love ourselves just the way we are. Well, listen, we are on Facebook and Twitter. And, of course, you can follow us on Twitter at Our Take TV. And remember, like and leave comments on our Facebook page at Our Take on Arise TV. And you are watching Our Take.